Hi guys, I'm uh, Ben Swartzlander, the PTL of the Manila project, and I'm here to do uh, the project update for Manila for the Okada and Pike releases. Um, I'm going to preface this presentation by saying uh, you guys are more than welcome to interrupt me with questions. Um, this will be a lot more fun for me if it's, if it's a discussion, but if you guys are shy and you don't want to ask any questions, um, that's fine, I'll just talk. Uh, but if you do ask any questions, please please try to use the microphone. Um, so let's start off with uh, what is Manila, for those that don't know. Uh, Manila is the shared file systems as a service project. Um, the simplest way to describe it to people who are familiar with OpenStack is it's like Cinder, but for NFS. But that's a gross oversimplification. Um, it, it's similar insofar as it, it allows individual tenants in a cloud to self-service provision storage without the involvement of an administrator. Um, and so uh, it fits into the OpenStack ecosystem very well for that reason. But it's different than Cinder uh, because it's shared file systems, which are significantly different than uh, block storage. Um, I'd say the, the main use cases where it would make sense to use something like Manila as opposed to Cinder is a uh, if you need storage that's accessible to multiple instances, block storage is inherently limited to a single instance. Um, so there's a lot of use cases around um, you know, sharing the storage across multiple compute instances where Manila makes sense. Uh, file storage is inherently more elastic than block storage. Um, you know, block storage has a pretty fixed size. It's hard to make it grow or shrink. Sometimes you can't make it shrink. File systems are very easy to, to resize uh, bigger and smaller. Um, and so you don't always have to guess how much storage you need up front uh, if you're using shared file systems. And probably the most important use case is uh, there's a huge uh, base of existing applications that are built around shared file systems uh, that already have NFS knowledge. Um, and having something like Manila is essential to making those applications you know, cloud ready. Um, so there's a lot of interest in Manila from uh, more traditional applications uh, that used NFS. Um, so this is an update on Okada and Pike, but I'll start off with a brief history for people that haven't been involved with the project. Uh, the idea for Manila goes all the way back to the Folsom Design Summit uh, and conversations between me and Rob Esker. Um, at the time of Folsom, uh, Nova Volume was just being split out as a separate project from Nova. Uh, the idea for Cinder was, was coming around. Um, so we saw that there was, you know, block storage was well supported in OpenStack, object storage was well supported, there wasn't anything for shared file systems, and uh, that's where the idea for Manila started off. Uh, the code started off as um, patches to Cinder. We, we had hoped at the time that uh, Cinder would become the storage project for, for OpenStack, um, and it would handle both blocks and shared file systems, but that was not to be. And it turned out that was probably a good thing. Uh, because uh, having two separate teams has enabled us to, to tackle problems more efficiently than if, if we had been de dealing with both the block stuff and the shared file system stuff in the same project. Um, so we officially forked from Cinder in August 2013. Uh, Manila became an official OpenStack project in the Juno release. Um, and since then, we've had about 3,700 commits from 270 individuals from 57 organizations according to Stackalytics. Um, so a lot of contributions. The project has come a long way uh, since, since uh, it started. We're up to 22 drivers, which is um, not quite where Cinder is, but it still uh, you know, shows significant involvement from storage vendors. Um, and in addition to NFS, uh, we support five other shared file system protocols, including SIFS, Gluster, Ceph, HDFS, and just most recently, the uh, Map RFS was added. Um, So we'll talk about uh, features from Okada. Um, <clears throat> Okada was kind of a short release, uh, but we still got a decent amount of work done during the Okada release. Uh, the first thing I'll, I'll mention is um, we changed the concept of consistency groups to be share, share groups. Um, and I just saw that there's a misspelling on there. Um, sorry about that. The, uh, the concept of consistency groups was added uh, in the Liberty release. and. Um, it was a relatively inflexible feature uh, that was requested by some users. And it turned out that after we added it, we realized that not even everyone agreed on what a consistency group was supposed to be. 
Um, and different people had different ideas about what consistency groups should be, and it, the implementation was a huge mess. And so fortunately, it was, a, it was an experimental feature, and we were able to um, just rip it out and replace it with something that we're much more happy with, which is share groups. Um, it's a generic grouping concept that is, uh, you can use for any purpose. Um, you can still do things like create consistent snapshots with a share group, but the idea is there will be a lot more capabilities that will be added over time with share groups, and it's a fundamentally more flexible grouping concept. Um, and uh, it was, that was added in Okada. Uh, we added multiple snapshots. So the use case here is, um, you know, suppose you have a share with a bunch of files on it, and um, you accidentally rm minus rf star in the wrong directory and blow a bunch of stuff away, or you overwrite a file. Um, in any case, somehow your data gets corrupted. So you say, well, crap, I gotta fix this. Fortunately, if you have a snapshot, uh, Manila's always had the capability to just create a new share from your snapshot. You can go mount that, and get your data out. Um, unfortunately, some backends can't create new shares from snapshots very efficiently, and they involve copying a bunch of data around. And um, if all you wanted to do was just mount it, grab some data out, and then unmount it and be done, um, a mountable snapshot would do exactly what you wanted. So we added that capability in Okada so that um, backends that can implement that efficiently uh, have an alternate way to recover data from a snapshot. The revert to snapshot feature is uh, similar. Um, the use case here is, imagine that you have a data set where you want to uh, start, start with from a known, um, a known set of data, run some experiments on it, modify the data, you know, run some application that's gonna manipulate the data and do some things. But then when you're done, you just wanna throw that all away, go back to where you were and start again. And maybe you wanna do this over and over again. It's a pretty common use case if you're just experimenting. Um, so again, in Manila, if you have a snapshot, you can create new new shares from the snapshot and do this kind of experimental workflow. But um, again, on many backends, that's, it's an expensive operation to create a whole new share um, if all you're gonna do is just blow it away when you're done and go back to what you had at the snapshot. So the revert to snapshot feature was added to address this use case. It's essentially a way that you can just time warp your share back to the last snapshot that you took. Um, and that's another optional feature that uh, some drivers started supporting in Okada. Um, snapshot migration was added. Uh, this is a really interesting feature. So um, migration was added uh, also back in the Liberty release. Um, and at the time, our, our main focus for the migration feature was to uh, be able to migrate from anywhere to anywhere and to have it be a, a totally widely supported feature that wasn't limited to only certain backends. Uh, so we implemented what we call the fallback migration path, which is all about um, you know, being able to migrate your, your data from any place to any other place. Uh, unfortunately, being able, having that amount of flexibility means that you have to make some compromises. So the fallback migration path can only, um, can only guarantee the, the contents of your files, the file names, and the directory structure, but we can't guarantee to preserve possibly vendor-specific metadata or any sort of file metadata bits beyond the standard POSIX you know, metadata. Um, and so what ended up happening is, is users said, well, it's nice to be able to migrate, but I need to know that when I migrate, I'm getting a bit exact copy of my data and that absolutely everything is exactly the same after the migration as it was before the migration. We heard that very loud and clear from users. So we implemented a a sort of a driver-assisted migration path where if, if the source and the destination of the migration are on two different uh, storage controllers that are compatible such that the driver knows how to migrate the data for Manila, um, that it can do that and leave it up to the driver to handle the migration and in that way we can ensure that there's absolutely no data loss. Um, so that, that work was done uh, prior to Okada and then in Okada what was added was the ability to also preserve your snapshots because once, once the storage, or once the driver is involved in ma managing the data migration, um, bringing along the snapshots is uh, not that much extra work and so Manila now supports uh, that mode of snapshot migration as well. Um, more about Okada. Um, so another 
change related to migration, um, we implemented a two-phase migration API. Migration was originally conceived as a one-phase operation. You say migrate, and it goes to the other place, and it takes as long as it takes. And in the period between when you start the migration and when you end the migration, you kind of don't know what's going to happen. You know, you kind of don't know when it's going to get done. So this creates a problem. Um, imagine, imagine you have a lot of data, like you got a 50 terabyte share that you want to migrate from one place to another. Um, even even with like 10 gig Ethernet, that's going to take a couple of hours, more likely a couple of days to migrate that amount of data. Um, so what you'd really like to be able to do is to tell the system, start migrating my data, um, and let me keep using it while that's happening. Um, so in, in, the, in the fallback uh, migration path, you, you can only have read-only access to your data while a migration is in progress. Um, with the uh, driver-assisted migration, it is possible to, to do, um, you have to have a writable access to your share while a migration is in progress, so that if it's gonna take a week, you can keep using your data um, right up until that last point when um, there's inevitably gonna be a disruption uh, when the migration completes because your share is gonna stop being here and start being there. Um, so the, what the two-phase migration API allows you to do is to decide when that's going to happen. So it gets almost all the way done and then it waits for you to say, okay, now cut over. Um, so you can schedule that to happen in the middle of the night or during some downtime or um, whenever is convenient for you as a user. Uh, so during Okada, we had three new drivers added. Uh, there's a constant flow of new drivers in every release. We're always welcoming new drivers. We got uh, the Dell EMC VMAX driver in Okada, uh, QNAP, and the MAP RFS driver, which includes um, the protocol support for MAP RFS as well. And uh, the last thing I'll mention about Okada is we did some work on Twos integration. For those that don't know, Twos is a library that supports uh, distributed locking and other distributed computing uh, primitives. Um, these are important for uh, the ability to run multiple copies of a service um, across multiple nodes and have them stay in sync with each other and avoid um, you know, various race conditions and other uh, mutual, mutual exclusion problems. So uh, during Okada, we got the twos library integrated and there's work ongoing uh, for twos that I'll talk about a little, in a little bit. <clears throat> so um, Pike, We've been working on Pike for a couple of months now. I would say the main feature that I'll mention for Pike is IPv6 support. And before I confuse anybody, um, Manila has always supported IPv6 for things like access to the REST API, communication between the various services, um, communication between the, the share service and storage controllers. Um, but it turned out there was a hole um, in the actual share access. Um, when, uh, when you go to mount the share from a compute instance, uh, we only supported IPv4. Um, and so during the Okada release, we recognized this problem and, and uh, decided that we needed to uh, add IPv6 support. It, it unfortunately didn't get done during Okada, um, large, largely because um, testing issues. Uh, the code was more or less ready. Uh, it turns out that um, the bits to support IPv6 with NFS were only added upstream in the last couple of years, and the, uh, the stack that we were using to test with Ubuntu uh, didn't have the right bits for testing. So um, we made the decision to, to use a Red Hat-based distro for all of our IPv6-related testing, and uh, this feature will hopefully go into Pike. It's a high-priority feature for us, IPv6. Um, Solometer integration. Presumably, you guys all know what Solometer is. It's a time series data collection service, uh, telemetry as a service. Um, a lot of OpenStack projects have integration with Solometer. Uh, Manila hasn't really done it yet, so uh, we're getting around to it now. Um, we'll be able to provide various uh, telemetry, like um, sh you know, number of shares, total, total shares consumed, and other things that would be interesting from a Manila perspective. Um, the other feature on here, shared usage monitoring, is, is related. Um, so this is actually, uh, this came up just in the last couple of weeks as a, an important feature for Pike. So um, as I mentioned before, 
shares can be uh, very elastic in terms of, of size. And, and one of the advantages of shared file systems is that you don't need to necessarily know how, much, how big your share needs to be at the beginning, like you do with the volume. Um, you can you know, say, hey, give me a 100 terabyte share, give me a petabyte share. Um, and then you know, that's usually easy for most backends to provide as long as it's empty. Uh, and then once you start filling it up, then you find out you know, how much data you actually need. So, um, but, but the problem is, is uh, deployers who want to support that mode of, of using uh, shared file systems don't have a way to bill for how much you actually do use. So you know, if someone says, give me a petabyte share, and you say, sure, uh, if they actually use that whole petabyte, that's a lot of bytes, uh, and you want to be able to bill them for the amount that they're actually using. So um, in Pike, we're working on a feature to allow the share manager to r find out through the driver uh, how much space is being used in each share uh, and report that through the same um, interface uh, to Solometer so that you could export that, uh, that information to a billing application or other sort of storage management application and do the right thing with it. Um, on the quotas side, um, there's, there's a few new features related to quotas. Um, so quotas on uh, replicas, um, share replication was a feature that was added uh, several releases ago. Um, and when we added it, it turned out we forgot to put a quota on the number of replicas you can create. So it turns out that today you could actually request thousands and thousands of replicas and Manila would try to create them, uh, which is not a good thing. Um, Group quotas, uh, again, share groups is a new feature. Um, they ne there needs to be a quote on it just uh, to prevent people from creating millions of them and causing a denial of service attack. Uh, the more interesting one is per share type quotas. So the, the theory here is uh, if, I'm an if I'm an administrator and I have you know, like a really nice, fast, expensive storage and a bunch of you know, cheap, crummy storage, I would like to be able to, to set my quotas such that a, a user could you know, maybe only get 100 gigabytes of the really fast, you know, super good storage because I don't want them eating that all up. But then I could, um, and I could do that through the quota system by creating a share type for you know, super fast storage and giving the user a 100 gigabyte quota on that. Um, but then I could have a slow, slow share type that maybe is really cheap, cheap storage that I have a lot of and I don't really care how much users use. And so I could give you, you know, a higher quota on that um, and that way um, you could have different quotas for different classes of storage, so this is a new feature coming in Pike. User messages is a feature that um, the idea came from Cinder. A lot of our ideas come from Cinder. There's significant cross-pollination between the two teams. Um, the idea here is uh, there are some operations that happen in Manila where um, you request the operation, the request succeeds, but then later the operation fails. Um, this happens in Cinder too. Uh, and there's no way for Manila or for the server to tell the client what the error was because the request already succeeded and the operation that was triggered by that request was the thing that failed. So the idea here is to create a mechanism for when things fail asynchronously to be able to store a message so the user can find out what happened. And, and ultimately the goal here is so that the UI can tell the user your operation failed and here's why and hopefully avoid situations where the user has to go file trouble tickets with the administrator or go bug the administrator if it's something that the user could solve on his own. So <coughs> uh, this is a, a useful thing to have just from a usability perspective. Um, so I alluded before to uh, some features that were experimental when they were added. Um, some of them have been around for a while and we're, we're pretty happy with them and we're ready to mark them non-experimental. In particular, the, uh, the migration API after the most recent changes in the Okada release, we're very happy with it. Um, there's nothing to stop us from a, you know, officially supporting this API going forward and marking it non-experimental. Also, the, uh, the, replica the replicated shares API is something that has been added a while ago and hasn't really undergone any changes since it was added. Um, and we're, you know, while, while there's more work to be done on the replication side, we don't anticipate it affecting uh, the APIs. So we're, uh, we're looking to see if we can mark those features um, non-experimental in the Pike release. And lastly, uh, there's more work on the active-active uh, deployment scenario. Um, so as I alluded to, uh, we, we have two, the two support in there. The, the idea here is um, Deployers, especially uh, distros like Red Hat, um, 
like to be able to scale out all the services um, uh, so that you can have um, so you can get extra scalability by having multiple copies of services and extra reliability. So in case something goes down, you have another copy of the service running. Uh, we're very interested in supporting uh, this in, uh, in Manila. And so there's work ongoing during the Pike release to support that feature. And um, beyond, beyond Pike, uh, there aren't any official plans. The, the, the tradition with Manila is we typically carry over un, you know, unfinished work from release to release, and we, we plan about one release ahead. So um, we feel like we have enough plan for Pike, and uh, we'll see how the rest of the release goes. Does anyone have any questions for me? I knew you guys would be shy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you say oh. a little bit more about the active active work that's going on? Uh, I looked at some point a little bit about trying to do that with NFS and it didn't look like the protocol was really amenable to doing that. Uh. <clears throat> With NFS, so so when I say active active, I'm, I'm particularly referring to the services themselves. So Manila API, Manila Scheduler, uh, okay. Manila Share. Um, so there are individual drivers uh, and individual storage controllers that uh, have single points of failure or or don't have single points of failure, depending on the storage architecture behind them. So um, you know some vendors already have storage controllers that don't have a single point of failure, um, and in, in if you're using one of those. Um, your main concern is just the, Manila, the availability of the Manila service, right? If the Manila service goes down, I can't delete shares, I can't snapshot shares, I can't create shares, that's a problem. Um, but, but you still have access to your data, right? Any, any shares that already exist are fine. Uh, there are some first party drivers like the LVM driver, the generic driver, that um, are open source and the infrastructure for those are on the Manila node or on a Nova VM. And those do have single points of failure um, that we would like to address, but that's that's a separate concern. So the question is, are we going to do what Cinder does and require drivers to confirm they support active active? Um, I actually wasn't aware that Cinder had gone that route. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, we'll have to think about if we want to do the same thing. I'm, I'm not, to, to be honest, I'm not sure why uh, that would be necessary. Um, maybe it's a QA concern. You just want to know that someone has tested it. Um, so we, we, we may want to require that uh, that a vendor um, certifies that it's been tested before we allow that configuration to work. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like it. Thank you. I hope these aren't dumb. <laughs> One is uh, tenant networks and uh, virtual private networking in VXLAN. Is there any talk at all about support of that? The ability to plug in the storage to a tenant network? Uh, yeah. So. Um, that support's actually existed from day one, um, with varying caveats. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Manila is actually almost as old as Neutron, um, and for a long time, uh, Nova Network was was more dominant th than Neutron. And so, from the beginning, uh, Manila supported creation of shares where the export IP for the share was actually right there on the same tenant network. That was that initially the design was that was the only way it would work. It turned out that was really hard to set up in most circumstances if you had actual hardware because plumbing the, the Nova network VLAN through to the storage controller such that it would appear to be on the same network as the, as the client. Okay, so the API supports it, but the appliance might not? Or? Well, <clears throat> what ended up happening is, is we ended up of, uh, creating a different mode uh, back in the Kilo release uh, so that drivers can either support the concept of share servers, which is uh, which is the mechanism by which we provide shares on the tenant network that has existed from the beginning, or they can just provide uh, no share servers, which means everyone is going to access the share through some common IP on a storage controller and the routing, you know, and you're going to go through a router to get to it. Um, 
So since, since we did that split, I would say most of the focus has been on the simpler case, uh, where people just want to set up their storage and, and um, access it through a common IP and not have anything on the tenant network. Um, there has been work to make connecting real storage hardware to uh, virtual neutron networks work better. Uh, in fact, there was um, That's probably what I'm waiting for then. <laughs> yes. Uh, there was work during, um, I'm trying to remember if it was uh, Newton or Okada. I'm embarrassed, I can't remember. But uh, th there was uh, work added to uh, th our Neutron Network plugin to do port binding such that uh, <clears throat> if you have a provider network in Neutron that's connected to your storage controller, you can actually get share servers created by Manila to appear right on the tenant network. So you can, they're right on the same L2, L2 domain. You don't have to go through router to talk to them. Um, okay. So that, that, that exists. Um, okay, just probably not on my net app. <laughs> okay, uh, my second one had to do with uh, NFS version four and Kerberos and LDAP. I didn't really see anything about that in the user documentation. So if, if I want to have a, my tenant network with its own LDAP server or something, okay, and, and user okay. group mappings and so on. Um, yeah, so it, again, if you don't use share servers, the, the more simple configuration, then uh, everyone gets a, whatever the administrator set up. But if you do use share servers, uh, there's something you can create called a security service. Um, and unfortunately, support for security services varies from driver to driver. It's, it's not consistent. But um, you can set up Kerberos uh, domain and, and uh, other you know, Kerberos authentication information in the security service. Um, that's attached to the share network. And then if you create share, shares on that share network, the storage controller will configure Kerberos the way you asked. Okay, so you could have uh, different tenants with different configs. Yes, yes, I, if, if you're using the, the share servers mode of the driver. And again, that's a, that's a big giant switch we added back in um, the Kilo release that most people don't, don't use because it's complicated. I mean, it, there's a lot more concepts that the, the administrator and the tenant have to understand to, to do that. Um, but obviously, some people do want that, so, so it, it is supported. Um, but the testing there is not at where it needs to be. Okay. So um, if you find bugs, we would like to fix them. <laughs> good, good. Um, one of the things that was missing on like the list that you, you plan to implement or that's in the planning is the integration with the OpenStack client. Actually, on you know, running a large um, OpenStack deployment, we're trying to use this to basically consolidate on the OpenStack client. So we like trying to convince them that yes. rather than using Nova and Cinder, they use OpenStack client. Now we introduce Manila and they basically have to either use Docker or use special nodes or in, you know, install the client themselves in order to use Manila. Okay. So is that anything that yeah, uh, we've been interested in integrating with OpenStack Client from the beginning. Um, it, exactly how that works has been uh, sort of a, a, it's a question, the answer to which has changed over time. Um, so there's some limitations in OpenStack Client around microversions and other things that, that we use in Manila um, that, have been, that have prevented us from doing the integration in the past. And, and furthermore, um, we're very interested in being able to run Manila in a standalone way, much like Cinder guys like to be able to run Cinder and stand because there are applications where you don't want all of OpenStack, you just right. want Cinder or Manila or, or the two services. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't see a world where the, the Manila client ever goes away entirely, but we obviously want it to integrate with OpenStack clients such that users who just want one client can get that. Um, it hasn't been a high priority, but it's something that we've been wanting to do as, as soon as all those dependencies are, are straightened out. Um, okay. It's just sort of a back burner thing. <laughs> Question about the project. Uh, the project will support the uh, role based edge control with a hierarchical uh, sharing. Hierarchical what? Uh, sharing because of the, for example, for a grant, maybe the, the project manager can access uh, sh the, the fire, the employee part. I mean, the hierarchical access with the sharing. Are you talking about hierarchical shares? So yeah, right. Hierarchical um, sharing. So, I don't, 
I'm trying to imagine what the use case is here, but I, I don't think I don't think that we support it. So, so the, the the model behind Manila is, you know, like Cinder, it's it's a self-service. So typically, you know, you if you want storage, you 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 create a share as big as you need it to be, mm -hmm. and you mount it at the root, and you own the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, protocols like NFS will allow you to mount subtrees, yeah, right. um, and, and you can do things like that. Yeah, the tree, the um, tree, yeah, right. But Again, that, that's just an NFS detail. Uh, from Manila's perspective, it's just one share. There's, there's no hierarchy that, that we're aware of. Um, so I, it, if you think there's something missing, I, I'd like to understand what, what's missing. Because I think that you could probably, you know, file systems are directory trees that are inherently yeah, right. hierarchical. Yeah, directory trees. And for the, the attributes of one file C10, oh, any file. Any file you, you could be shared, it, uh, just apply uh, some policy in to add into this file. For example, my uh, file can be shared by my, uh, can be shared to uh, my, uh, my boss, but I could not be okay, shared. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I think you're talking about a uh, file access control. Yeah, right. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, uh, Manila does not get involved with the individual file access control. That, that, that's a data protocol thing for mm -hmm. NFS and SIFS and other protocols. Okay. Um, so, you know, NFS has its own way of doing access control on directories and on files. Mm -hmm. um, and once you have a share, you know, you can chmod and challenge files as you want. If, if it's a SIF share, you know, you can set owners and set, set uh, all the Windows, you know, permission bits. Yeah, right. So, and, and so, so that, that, that's an in-band activity between the client and the, the storage controller mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that the, the shared file system protocol supports. Manila is not involved with any of that. Okay, it just you. works. Okay. All right. So, thank you guys. <laughs>